Okay, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, Robert's very kindly invited me back to have a little chat with you about um, sustainable project management again and to present to you a paper that we gave at the European Academy of Management last year in Warsaw, Poland, on responsible business model innovation. So to give you a bit of a background as to why sustainable project management is such a hot topic at the moment, because it's related to sustainability in business is a huge thing at the moment. Um, this paper is a pretty good paper. It, got a, it won an award for the most innovative paper uh, at the time, and hopefully we'll get into a good journal soon. Um, so we'll give you an overview of this, and then maybe we'll have a bit more of an informal, maybe 20, half an hour or so, and you guys have got to write a journal article, haven't you, for Robert's assessment. It's very kind of you, isn't it? So we'll give you some ideas, maybe, of how you can, um, what, you, what topics you could think about for that. It's a bit late. Have we done it? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, so responsible business model innovation. So the idea was um, we wanted to write a paper about how business models is the most important thing that we can do to kind of change the way that the world works, if you like. Responsible innovation is a topic that's getting more and more um, in interest in academia at the moment and in industry, but it tends to be about uh, manufacturing, about construction, and about actually making physical things. So innovating at the kind of product or service level. Whereas I kind of think, well, that's kind of a bit too late down the line. It's the actual business model that we should be looking at first. Because, you know, you can have a responsible product. You can make these bottles of water. They're so thin now. Do you know why they're so thin? Less material. Less material, cheaper for the companies, but also less carbon because they're lighter to transport around the world, etc., etc. So some people would say, well, that's a responsible, innovative product. However, the business model of selling water you know, all around the world, you know, in developing countries as well, in places like California, which are water stressed because people are bottling it and selling it as Coca-Cola. Is that a responsible kind of thing to do in the first place? So that's kind of was the, the thinking behind it, I guess. So responsibility and innovation, sustainability, it's an uncertainty, but it's also an opportunity. So this picture here, what does this kind of depict, you think? Stock market stresses. Stock market stresses. In particular, I can say this to you guys, because you guys are old enough. 2008, global financial crisis, big meltdown, you know, whole economic shock, if you like. I'd say this to my undergraduates now, and they would look at me blankly. Then I kind of realised, I kind of think, actually, most of them were 12 when the, when the financial crisis hit. It makes you feel old, doesn't it, yeah? They were 12 years old, <laughs> my first years. And so they don't really understand it. They're kind of, they only just kind of were really thinking that there was this issue at the time. And then we have this going on all over the world at the moment, okay? So this kind of represents, this is in, um, where is this one? Is this Italy or Spain? Uh, Spain. Spain, isn't it? Yes. Spanish. So this is the protests against the um, austerity measures in Spain. And um, we've seen this kind of rise, I guess, of activism and citizenship again. There was a lot of people on the streets yesterday about our, you know, our, our vote on the war with Syria, etc. But anti-capitalism, a lot of people saying, well, Business is wrong. We need to fix business. There's a problem here. And business is causing a lot of pain for people, anti-austerity, etc., etc. So there's always been some protests against big business, but now it's getting a little bit more juicy, if you like. It's getting starker. So this is a problem for business. You know, We're starting to see, well, actually, if people are protesting against the way that we do business and our current models of capitalism, maybe we should think about dealing with that to some degree. So it's an opportunity as well. And this was the Economist in 2008. This was their um, front page right after the kind of all the shit at the fan, frankly. Um, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and all these big camp companies, the subprime mortgage lending, big financial crisis. And it was kind of like, well, what's next? Everything's gone down the tubes. All, all business has kind of fallen apart. You know, the banks are having to be renationalized. What do we do now? How do we kind of move forward? And at the time, there was a lot of doom and gloom about how we can do this. But recently, a lot of businesses over the last kind of you know, six or seven years have started to say, well, actually, this is an opportunity to think about maybe doing things differently, to realize that perhaps some of our brands of capitalism haven't worked. Perhaps we can come up with a new way of doing things. And that's why I like to work. So innovation. So there's a lot said about innovation, but it's always applied, or generally applied, to kind of, again, product, services, technical. It's about you know creating something better, a better service, a better being, a better 
projector. It's always thought of a technical way to do things. However, again, coming out of the financial crisis, a lot of people started to talk about, you know, we can actually innovate our way out of these recessions. We can potentially come up with new models, new ways of doing business that create a more resilient system. So we can start to innovate these kind of business as a core kind of construct, if you like, rather than just the products and services within it. And there's a lot of opportunities there. Anybody know who this guy is? Apart from Robert. It's Robert's favourite philosopher. It's Joseph Schumpeter. It's a German philosopher. He had to be German, didn't he? German philosopher <laughs> who wrote a lot about innovation and about how innovation is a key to lots of markets, etc. And he talked about there being lots of different ways of innovative opportunity. So yes, new products, new production methods, new supply sources, new markets to go into, but also new organisational approaches. Again, this is what I'm really interested in. New ways of doing business differently, and from a project manager's point of view, new ways of managing projects differently. I'm not, I'm not, I've kind of fallen out of love with the PM Bock and things like that, and these bodies of knowledge which tell you how to manage projects. They tell you how to do things the same way they've been done for many years, okay, with little incremental kind of in, I improvements maybe. Whereas I kind of think, well, a lot of what we're doing with business and project management is, is broken. We need to maybe throw it all out and start again to some degree and think about kind of whole, fresh new ways of looking at things. So Schumpeter, yeah, a very interesting philosopher, came up with lots of different ways we can innovate, innovate but unfortunately we've only been concentrating <coughs> on some of these kind of easier ones to do, I guess. So many companies maintain this really narrow view of the term innovation. So you go, you, you open any well, manufacturing or technology company's website, it's all about innovation, we innovate, we do this, we do that, you know, we're an innovative company, we create faster mobile phones, etc., etc. It's all about innovation in the technical sphere. Nobody's talking about the, well, a few people are talking about the innovative way we are delivering our business model. Very few people. So it's mainly a technocentric paradigm, okay, it's all about the technology. However, business innovation can be huge. It could come from new organizational pr pr um, processes and systems. And um, I can't say that word because I'm not Swedish. Bryn John Hossen, wherever it is, he wrote a lovely paper back in 2011 talking about and showing some empirical data about how organizational processes and systems, so new ways of doing business, can actually co uh, um, create more profit, more opportunity, more value than just kind of coming up with new products and new services. Okay, so you can innovate at the organisation level and come up with better ways of doing things and be successful. And one of the key tenets of, in, uh, of responsible innovation, as the term is used, is these questions here. Innovation for who? Okay, innovation for what? Innovation that is useful, that is needed by people, by society, not innovation for innovation's sake. And I love this picture here that I've put on there. So can you see what this is? <coughs> this is a single packaging for your... Um, for your champagne. So this was marketed on their company as their innovative approach to marketing and packaging. Okay, that's, you know, so you can carry it home from the supermarket. That's not that's, that, that's not responsible innovation. That's creating a wholly unnecessary extra piece of product, if you like. Okay, an extra piece of marketing. But you know, people buy things like that. There is a market for you know prestigious or whatever that else that might be. I think that's irresponsible innovation. What's it made out of? Is it plastic? It's a good question. I don't know. It looks like it, doesn't it? But um, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's like porcelain or something. Or yeah. What's that? Small waste. It's more waste. Do you need more packaging? I mean, I've got an innovative way of packaging champagne. You stick it inside your belly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carry it around with you inside you. So responsible innovation. So I think people often forget that innovation, as Shumida talked about, it was to a degree about making people's lives better. Okay, it's not just about creating new products for new products' sake. And the capitalists, if you like, or big businesses would say, well, we're innovating, therefore we're growing, we're creating more value with our company, therefore we're creating more money, therefore we are helping society. Okay, if anybody believes that um, the money trickles down from the top to the bottom, you just have to take a look around the world nowadays and kind of think, well, it's not always the case, is it? So innovation should be about making people's lives better in many different ways. And what we say about responsible innovation, or von Schoenberg says, is tran uh, it's, it's a transparent, interactive process by which societal actors and innovators become mutually responsive to each other with a view to the ethical acceptability, sustainable, desirability of innovation products and its uh, process. 
So what that's saying is that companies should be innovating along with the people it's innovating for. Okay, so you don't just create products and keep churning them out, churning them out, churning them out. You work with your stakeholders to say, well, what do we need? What do we actually need to make the world a better place? And you don't have to be a nice social company to do this. This is, this is um, to a degree, this is Apple Computer's take on the world. Okay? The difference between Apple and Samsung, I mean, what do you think the difference between Apple and Samsung is? Have you got any idea what it might be? What do they do differently in terms of products? Is it focus on user, the user themselves, not the product? Apple are famous for that. Yeah, they're famous for producing what they think the user will want. And so they do a lot of work with their, with their faithful, if you like, to go out there and say, well, what do we need? Which is why they've got a very small product line, haven't they? Do you mean they've got you know, a range of iPhones and the computers, etc.? But it's very small for a technology company. You look at Samsung. There are thousands of different Samsung handsets and phones. and They do everything from you know, you know, commercial kind of air conditioning fans to like mobile phones and bits and bobs and things for uh, um, airplanes and stuff. And so they just keep churning out lots and lots of products on the hope that one of them will stick. Okay, the Galaxy you know, range of phones are stuck, but they've still got lots of other handsets. So their approach is very different. It's not about working with users. It's about just churning things out, hoping that some of them work. So Apple's approach is a little bit different. And responsible innovation should take that into account and talk about the social desirability and acceptability of specific products as well. Okay, again, is it right to be marketing bottled water in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, or... Who's that guy? There was a chairman of Nestle, wasn't it, who... Um, there's a nice video of him on YouTube saying that water is not a human right. So Nestle as a company have the right to bottle water and sell it, because, you know, nobody has the right to have water. What's it going to be next? Air. <laughs> we don't have the right to air, we bottle air. It's a slightly dodgy view, but there we go. So wasn't he railing against corporate responsibility at that point? He was, yeah. People were saying to him, well, is it really fair to be kind of having a bottling plant that's bottling water in water-stressed parts of the world to then sell to the developed countries, if you like? And he was saying, well, no one's got a right to water. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because the, idea, the problem was they were causing water-stress problems for people's irrigation, people couldn't grow their own crops in sub-Saharan sub Africa, subsistence farmers, and he was saying, well, that's tough. You know, you can buy the water from us, it's not your right. Yes. Very nice man. He's still there. Um, so here with uh, innovation, it's expected that the consideration of ethical and social aspects to an innovation process is will lead not only to technological innovations which are socially acceptable, but also desirable. Okay, so innovation products that we want as people, not just that we think we need or think we want. Okay, I'm trying to think of a good example. There's lots of stuff out there, isn't there? If you go to just walk around the shops here, there's lots of things. And if you've got children, Few years now? God, it's just me then. One of the children. If you've got children, the amount of things that are marketed at you that you have to have because you're a parent, otherwise your baby will die. And none of it is kind of useful or needed at all. It's not socially desirable, but it's marketable in such a way that if you don't have this special piece of equipment to the one that used to get me is like um, you get little things to suck, you know, mucus out of babies' noses. So for God's sake, do you know what I mean? And they're really expensive. And you get these mats you could put under the beds as well, so if the baby starts moving, it sends it off alarm. Do you know what I mean? And if you don't buy that, your baby could die. It's horrible. It's not a socially acceptable, desirable piece of technology, but it works, and people produce it, and we would say that's probably not necessarily a responsible thing to do, <coughs> just because there's a market for it, potentially. So despite the desire at the moment to reconcile this idea of innovation with social outcomes, responsible innovation is still this technocentric perspective. So again, when we're talking about sustainability and ethics and things like that in terms of innovation, people still think about the product design, about making products that use less energy or products that use less material, et cetera, et cetera. However, the, the, all the motivations coming through, and this was trying to make the point in this conference, because I realized when we were talking at this conference, the people who were hosting it or the particular track I was speaking in were some of the key writers on responsible innovation. So I was basically telling them that they were focusing in the wrong area, which is something that is great to do when you're an academic, you know, you basically throw in a bomb and you walk away and wait for them to shout at you. So I was making the point that in all of the journals that are out there in this area, it's all about technological viewpoints. And I was saying to them, look, you've got to get yourself off the technology. We've got to start asking ourselves, is this the right thing to do in the first place, rather than how can we make this piece of technology better, which is what they were doing. So with respect to this, we've got this technocentric paradigm of responsible innovation, and it's driven by these tr traditional concepts, which says that products and services are where you innovate. So it's not really their fault, it's the fault of society. Okay, so what about business models? 
But a business model, lots and lots of different definitions, but the common one is a plan for the successful operation of a business to identify sources of revenue, the intended customer, uh, based on the products and details of financing. So what is your product, how are you going to get it to market, who is your market, where is your money going to come from? Quite simple. Every single company, big or small, will have a business model at some point, some kind. And it's a market-driven device that's closely related to innovation. So it's a base of basically a way of saying, well, how are we going to get this particular product out into the market and be the best at it and sell most of them? Okay? And sometimes you have to innovate about the way that you actually deliver that product or service. But to gain the benefits of innovation activities, business, which is what I was suggesting, or thesis here as well, you, businesses don't need to just innovate in product, service, or design, but at the level of the business model entirely. So it's starting again from scratch and saying, well, how can we do this completely differently? It's a story actually, I've just come into my head, which I'll tell you. Have you ever heard the story about the architect uh, who was commissioned to design a new hospital? Um, not far from here, down near Teesside. And he was put on this big kind of contract and said, we need a big new super hospital in Teesside. Go away, get your team together, design it for us, tell us what we need. And he went away and he came back you know, several weeks later and he just had one piece of paper and had a picture of a helicopter on it. And then, well, what's this? This isn't a hospital. He said, you don't need a hospital. He said, we've looked at it. We've looked at the options of players. We've looked at the infrastructure around here. We've looked at the other hospitals that are in the area. What you need is a better fleet of, hosp of, of helicopters to take people to these hospitals on the outskirts rather than a brand new hospital smack bang in the middle of the place here. You need a better transport infrastructure. Okay? You don't need a brand new hospital. Okay? They built the new hospital anyway, of course. They got rid of it. But that's the idea. <laughs> that, to a degree, is responsible business model. It's not just building a hospital for the sake of it because it's said to be there. It's looking at the, all the options and saying, well, actually, the hospital wasn't the best option in this case. It was upgrading the transport infrastructure, maybe putting in place an air ambulance to take people to the nearest hospital, which only happened to be something like 100 miles away, which isn't a great distance when you think about things. So it's about, yeah, so you might not stay in business long if you do that with every client. However, if you've got some ethics in you or you've got some ideas about what you do, it's about looking at things slightly differently, I guess. So it's important to examine to what extent business model innovation can support the delivery of responsible and sustainable products and services. So again, for me, it's one thing to come up with you know, really nice sustainable materials or really nice new products. But if you're still getting into market in the way that means we're exploiting, you know, other people's kind of, you know, areas or goodwill, then that's that's not a responsible thing to do. So again, you'll see, um, what's the Coke one? There's a Coke one, isn't it? Coke Green, have you seen that one? Everyone, everyone, when that came out last year, they were around the university giving away to everyone. And everyone thought that that meant that this was a fantastic, you know, ethically sustainable, you know, you know thing, because it was green. Do you know what Coke Green is? It's um, stevia, 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 the artificial sugar that's made from a natural substance. Absolutely. Which is a beautiful bit yeah, of greenwashing in itself. Exactly. It's got nothing to do with sustainability or ethics or anything like that. It's just that it's a natural based sweetener that they're using. You know, it's not sugar, it's a natural based synthetic. Yeah, whatever. But so in a, in a way, that's them trying to sell what they call the responsible, you know, you know, piece of marketing. But it's, it's not really, is it? It's still getting people hooked on Coca-Cola, which is very bad for you for lots of reasons, even though I drink it as well. <laughs> responsible business models, then. So this is not necessarily a new thing. Responsible business models are out there all over the place. And these are examples. So the cooperative business model. So there are lots of companies out there, the cooperative supermarket being the, being the famous one, you know, they're not just supermarket, they're a bank, they're a funeral directors, they're insurance, they sell car insurance, they do lots of different services. And they're a cooperative business model. The same with John Lewis, you know, the big store up in Newcastle, that's a cooperative business as well. And there are many other examples. And the idea is that their businesses and their values are aligned in such a way that their members, the people who work in the companies, actually are their shareholders. Okay, so if you work for John Lewis, you're a shareholder. If you shop at um, the co-op, like me and Robert do, because it's in our, it's where we live, it's in our village, you get a cooperative card. I'm a shareholder of the co-op because I have a cooperative card which I use and they get discount off. And you actually get a dividend every quarter because you've been investing in them by spending money in them. It's usually about a pound or something. What's the biggest one you ever got? You ever got anything, Robert? You yeah, get vouchers or something. Seems I spend more, so uh, I got 15 pounds back. There you go, yeah. So it's not a great deal. But the point is that you are a, a shareholder. Therefore, as a shareholder, you get a say in how the business is run. And I'm also in the cooperative bank, uh, Smile Bank is called. And they're what they were, 
we'll not go into that in too much detail, but they were an ethical bank, okay? And what they will do every quarter, and the quarter do the same, they've just done it, they'll email all of their shareholders to us, and they will say, what do you think we should be doing? Do you think we should be investing in arms or oil or whatever? Do you think we should be doing this, that, or the other? And we can vote on that. And then they take that forward, and that, that establishes their direction. Same with John Lewis and other stores like that. So we, we say these are usually, they are profit focused, they've got to be, because they're businesses who want to make a, a lot of money. But they also offer improved services, differentiated products, if you like. And cooperative business models have provided stability in the longer term. So following the 2008 crisis, a lot of them actually weathered it a lot better than big private companies. The reason being is because their shareholders were the people who worked there or bought their products there. They weren't like oil companies or people like that or other banks. <coughs> they weren't taken down to the same level as other companies. So they actually did quite well out of that. And we would say this is potentially has the um, ability to be a responsible business model. Okay. The other thing that John Lewis do, which is quite famous for, have you seen all the stuff about CEOs pay? Okay, so the chief executive gets paid, you know, a couple of million pounds a year, whereas the person cleaning the floor and the thing gets paid, you know, less than the minimum wage. Well, some cooperative models such as John Lewis have a multiple of salary rule, okay? And I can't remember what it is in John Lewis, it's something like 46 or something like that. So the CEO can only own, earn 46 times the amount of the person at the bottom of the chain. So if he wants to improve his wages, he has to improve the wages of the person who earns the least, okay? Whereas if you look at that in some companies, some companies it's in the thousands that the CEO earns more. Okay, I did look at it for the university once. I'll not tell you what it was because it was shocking. Um, but yeah, so trying to kind of be a little bit more ethically minded and does have a responsibility and you can potentially do better that way. So when they do this, uh, you know, 46% yeah. the lowest earner, does that include outsourced services? No, it doesn't, which is why I wasn't going to go into the university idea. Uh, yeah, because w w one of the things... I will tell you because there's no cameras. Oh, I'm being panopto, but who cares? <laughs> it's actually in the public report. So if you yeah. download our financial uh, annual report. I, yeah. I did some work with a company called Business in the Community, a charity who looks at responsible business. And one of their key campaigns <coughs> is around the living wage. So you're aware of this idea in the UK we have a living wage. So we have a minimum wage, so six pound, whatever, seven pound, whatever it is now and now. But we also have what we say is living wage. So believe it or not, in the UK, our minimum wage is not enough to live on. That's what we say. The living wage is a little bit more than that. It's not a lot. But a lot of companies have started paying that now. Starbucks, Aldi, Lidl, they've started to say, well, actually, we'll pay this because we see it as a good thing to do. Um, somebody asked the university whether we pay a living wage. The answer was, um, well, no, but we outsource most of our staff. So all of our cleaners and um, catering staff, the people who would normally be on the lowest salary, are not employed directly by the university. Therefore, we can quite confidently say we, they don't count to us. Now, that's kind of... In me, from my perspective, that's creative accounting a little bit. But that is the way that the world works, unfortunately. So, yeah. But uh, because of the co op and, and John Lewis, so they do retain all of their staff. So, the, so, yeah, the cleaners are generally employed by John Lewis, which is really rare in retail management. So, I used to work in it. It is, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, but again, these are driven on values. John Lewis, for instance, was established by an individual who was seen as a social reformer at his time and it's passed down through his family. So they could do that, it was easier for them to do that. The similar things with the cooperative. However, I keep going backwards and forwards. However, there are people looking at these now because they went through the storm so well since 2008, they've started to say, well actually, maybe we could adopt this model more readily and therefore we would then for, um, be better placed to have a more financially sustainable company. So there is some interest in this now. We've got social entrepreneurship, which is another um, growing kind of um, business area, if you like. And we've got a degree in social entrepreneurship now. And most universities are starting to come through this because it's seen as a new way of doing things. So a social enterprise is a business who has a primarily social objective. Uh, surpluses are usually reinvested back into the company rather than being driven by the need to maximize profits. So because you don't have shareholders, you recycle it back into your uh, company and you recycle that back into your services and it's supposed to help the people who you actually work with. It's got a relatively high pr uh, uh, priority given to promoting social value over economic value, lots of different published types, and it's being driven by, in some cases, the individual, uh, in some cases, the organisation. And this is getting quite interesting now because in the UK, at least, and lots of other countries, we've got this, what we call the big society, we've got the withdrawal of government away from services. So governments are no longer providing you know, social services to people, things like that, libraries, all the rest of it. Yeah, shaking your head there. So it's seen as a bad idea in lots of spheres, 
but it's the way that we're moving now. So a lot of companies are saying, well, actually, we can move towards this social entrepreneurship model. We can provide the services that way. And that's, I would argue, is a decent middle ground, okay? So it's not always good to be, pri well, it's probably not good to be privatized. It's not great always to be social um, public service. This is kind of in between the two. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds to a degree. So the idea is that you've got private business, public sector, social entrepreneurs, <coughs> kind of in the middle, okay? So you still kind of make a profit um, to a degree, but you reinvest it back in. And again, there's been criticism with this because, of course, you can still take out a lot of money as a CEO. You can take, you know, you have charity. Um, people who work for charities who earn £200,000, things like that, as the head of the charity. And so we're going to say, well, is that correct? However, then the, the idea is if you pay £70,000 for a CEO of a charity, you might not get as good a person if you pay £200,000. It's, so it's an age-old argument. But again, people are looking at social entrepreneurship as a way of delivering what they would argue is more responsible services and innovation. And again, you have this kind of whole relationship then between different businesses and motivations. So if you've got a social innovation down here, you know, people like social workers, for instance, as individuals, all the way up to organisations <coughs> such as commercial enterprises at the other end of the scale. Um, you've got single individuals, social worker, the social entrepreneur who works between business and also the social side. The entrepreneur is purely profit focused. And again, at this side, you've got the charitable trusts, which are a little bit of a business focused, public trusts, all the way up to NGOs, and in the middle, social enterprises. So we've got this kind of really muddy waters now. We used to just have, I guess, you know, NGOs and commercial enterprise. So we're kind of muddying the waters and we're trying to think, well, if we can sit in the centre, that's probably where responsible business models sit, okay, rather than at one of the extremes. So some examples. Um, this guy here, John McKay, um, CEO of Whole Foods, so American department, um, grocery store. They have some um, down south as well, down south, anywhere south of the River Tyne is down south for us. Um, got one in Cheltenham. And he's got a, a book, this is worth reading, called Conscious Capitalism. No, it's not, that's somebody else. Yeah, it is, Conscious Capitalism. And it's this idea that you can make money, you can apply capitalist principles, but still have a social mission. So they, you know, they pay a living wage, they pay a lot more to their workers, they pay their suppliers on time, um, they innovate in the way that they use energy in their organisation, they give money to charity. They try to kind of drive their business as a more of a in a more responsible way, it's the only term to use really. And again, they've been very, very, very successful in, 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 in the US. In the UK, they're quite expensive. So I would argue that yeah, it's, it's all very well being a responsible business, but if the only people that could shop there are you know, you know, middle and upper middle classes, if you like, they've got one in Cheltenham, for instance, rather than people shopping at Lidl, then this needs to trickle down to a degree. But then you can say the same about John Lewis? You can say the same about John Lewis, John of course you can. Very, very, really expensive. Yeah, you can, you can say the same thing. So, yeah. I, I totally agree with you, but I think we've got to start somewhere and trickle down, haven't we? Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Whole Foods, yeah, very expensive though, very expensive fruit. Then you've got other things, you've got thing, initiatives like 1% for the planet. Um, this is the idea that you put 1% of your pre tax prof profits back into social and environmental causes, and a lot of companies are getting interested in that now. It doesn't sound like a lot, 1%, but if you're making you know, 300, 400 million pounds, it's, it's quite a lot to give away to charity for nothing. Um, you are the only with charity, you give it to a local environmental causes the idea. So you'll, you'll give it to someone in the local economy rather than just giving it to N, in NGOs. And um, certified B corporations, again, this is a, a notion. Some big companies like uh, Virgin Money are kind of starting to kind of play with this. Again, these are corporations, it stands for Benefit B. So they're trying to show that they benefit their employees, their shareholders, also the people that work, the communities they work in as well. And they can be certified on that. And there's a lot of people who are interested in investing in these kind of businesses now. So since the financial crisis, banks are very sceptical about lending money. If you've ever tried to get a mortgage since then, you've got no chance. Or you know, if you're running a business, trying to get a loan for your business is very difficult. However, what they've started to say is, we will invest in you if you're more responsible, ethical and sustainable, because you've been shown that you can weather the storm a bit better. So banks are trying to now look at these labels and say, OK, we'll invest in you because you've got this label. And that gives us a little bit more certainty that you're going to be a little bit more responsible. <coughs> and also we can then market ourselves and say, look how good we are as HSBC because we invest in these kind of companies. So, yeah, it's not all altruistic, but anything that gets in there is good. And then Patagonia, another company that I like to talk about quite often. Um, Patagonia, they're an American <coughs> um, outdoor clothing company. Um, they're a family-based company owned by Yules, uh, um, Yvonne Schuillard. And they sell... Um, 
jumpers and jerseys and walking gear and all the rest of it. Um, and I'm trying to think, because I showed the students this yesterday, I haven't got it here. Their marketing campaign last year for Black Friday was, they had a big picture of one of their jackets and said, don't buy this jacket. People were like, what are you doing? That's such a weird marketing campaign. Their idea is that they do not want to sell more products. They want to sell better products that people will then keep for longer, tell their friends about, and they'll expand their customer base because their products are so good. And they were saying, if you've got a jacket that you've worn for many years from us and it's starting to fray or something, bring it back, we'll repair it for free. Okay, and that was their marketing campaign. Uh, they do a lot of things like that. They want to for the planet thing. They also buy a bit part of the Amazon and just leave it alone. Um, and the reason they've been making a lot of headlines is they've grown um, and tripled their profits over the last five years. So people have been saying, how are you doing that? How are you doing all of this good stuff but also tripling your profits at the same time? And there's been lots written on them because people thought there's something going on here. They've got it and they've just said, no, they're just doing business in a, in a good way, a responsible business. Okay, so most research and innovation is carried out from a policy or social or ethical perspective, focusing on the academic research and development environment, whilst most innovations take place in a commercial or industrial setting. So the point I was trying to make here is, because I was at an academic conference, is as academics, we're not really looking at this. The companies themselves are the ones that are coming up with all these new ways of doing things, because they have to. They're coming up with the innovations. And it's a bit like this in project management research, isn't it, Robert? I think we're, we're, we're a bit behind. We're maybe four or five years behind what businesses are doing, and that shouldn't be the case. In a way, academics should be the ones who come up with the complete random blue sky thinking who can then help businesses. There's lots of reasons for this. So my idea was kind of trying to say to these academics in this conference, well, start looking at this, guys. It's useful. And then we came up with our responsible business model um, idea, if you like. So you've got your traditional business model here, which is, you know, we make profit and um, potentially gives negative social impact, just makes profit. You've got your traditional not-for-profit model, okay, so you've got these social enterprises well, or NGOs or charities that are out there to make profit. We were saying a responsible business model does both, okay. You make profit, but you also provide social impact. And you can do that, and some of those companies I was talking about before have shown how they can do that. And more and more companies are at all levels. So we redefined the idea of responsible uh, innovation, which you saw the, 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 um, the business model, which you saw before. So a responsible business model for us was a plan for the successful operation of a business which identifies sources of revenue and contributions to economic development, products and services that improve the well-being of its identified customer base, workforce and societal sustainable development, and ethical sources <coughs> of products. So what we're doing is taking the normal business model idea, putting in societal, ethical, sustainable, in front of that as well. And so to guide people who are coming up with businesses, they can look at that and say, okay, so we want to have a responsible business model. Where are we going to get our financing from? We're going to get it from HSBC, RBS, Bank of Scotland. Actually, no, we're going to get it from the co-op group, or we'll get it from another, you know, social responsible investor. Things like that. So it's basically saying, if you're going to come up with a business model, identify ethical sources well, of finance. In, in the paper, the examples that I was thinking of as well, for, you can see it's the dimensions that you did your project on. Yeah. You can do crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. right? If you have the local uh, um, incentive. I did a research uh, project with one of my students in the summer that really looked at uh, alternative ways of raising uh, funds or yeah. uh, um, getting uh, <coughs> capital by the, the next paper we've got for the next conference, this conference is on every year, the next one is in Paris, and I'm writing a paper with an academic from Burgundy Business School. And we're looking <coughs> at uh, three, what we call, um, we're, we're looking at Kickstarter kind of things. There's loads of these Kickstarter things now, these crowdsourcing ones. But there are normal crowdsourcing places now, finance crowdsourcing kind of outlets, and there are ethical crowdsourcing efforts. And we're looking at their performance over time to see whether the ethical ones are better than the... Uh, so what's the difference between ethical crowdsourcing and normal crowdsourcing? Because this is a question that I've wondered about. Yeah. Obviously, you've got the two different types of market themselves, different things. Uh, inherently, surely, all crowdsourcing is ethical? Ethical because it doesn't yeah. require a, a borrowed seed, if you know what I mean, because it's coming. Depends where it comes from, then. Because ah, because there's a lot of power in the yeah, because the agenda is the power in the crowd yeah. that is funding you. You know, once they start defining maybe terms that then are potentially again unethical. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there so a lot of these well, crowd funding or crowd crowd financing is the term they use yeah. for, the, uh, for these big companies. A lot of them uh, are just ways of venture capitalists pooling together. Uh, and so, you know, you can be uh, a, a big oil baron putting your money into that way. The ethical ones are screened out. 
in terms of only accepting money from social responsible investors, individuals with credentials or businesses with credentials. Yeah. And um, our hypothesis is that those have performed slightly better over time in terms yeah. of stability than the other ones. Oh, and we look at to see if that's the case. It is, it's like the old credit union, yeah, exactly. Um, it's just a trendier term. Yeah, that, that's it. It's, it's come around because mm. when the uh, question was asked, so why like the, if there was proper affordable housing within the community, the community was quite willing to help. To fund it. Because yeah. if you plan that piece has been off, <coughs> it helped the own community to lead it. Yeah. So really people are interested in this now because the banks aren't ending. So crowd financing is a really big thing at the moment. But yeah, you've got to be ethically sourcing the finance. So it's, it's all very well having what you think is a sustainable project or business, but if you're taking your money from a, an ethical source, then we would say that isn't a responsible business model. So we're trying to join up all of those kind of those loops, if you like. And have you seen Brewdog, by the way? Brewdog, it's a beer company, and they have what they call equity punks, which is basically uh, it's a crowdsourcing. It means you can invest in them. You can buy a share in, in the beer company, and you get a little card, and you get cheaper beer when you go into their Brewdog breweries, etc., etc. But nobody had ever thought about this before, and they're huge now, and they're, they're, they're expanding out to, to the state at the moment. Um, they were just a small company. A couple of guys who worked in a brewery thought there must be a different way to do this. Went out there, crowdfunded, got this idea together, and now they're making millions. And you know, what I mean, so they're not necessarily a socially responsible company, but it's just an idea that you can crowdsource anything, pretty much. Yeah, a lot of actors now crowdsourcing their own movie. Have you seen that? I mean, they can't get their movie made. They go and crowdfund it, and you get a nice T-shirt to say, "I, I, I did this." Okay. Um, so yeah, so I think this is the summary, isn't it? Yeah. So again, um, I'm, for us, the responsible business model was the incorporation of the principles of sustainable development, so it's responsibility and ethics into the business model, the reconciliation of the conflicting interests of profit and social value. So one of the things that used to annoy me, in terms of value, you probably don't do it now, I used to, do, I used to teach on your value management module, you still have the value management stuff, yeah. I think you do it with Claudia, right? Do it Claudia, yeah, I used to teach on that, and we used to do an exercise trying to get you to think about what value is, because we say value, and most people think money. Value is not money, it's got nothing to do with money, it's just become kind of, the word has become kind of caught up in that. So, value and profit are different, and I used to get really annoyed working in local authority governmental projects where we talk about the project had to create value. And so we'd be fighting against the money people saying, where well, we have to make as much money as we can. And actually, in local government, the rules say that you have to create social value. Okay, so you can not make any money, but make a much better place to live for the people who live in your area. You can demonstrate you've created value. But people just can't get their heads around that. They say, well, we haven't made any money. So no, but you've improved the health and well-being of all these people. Oh, that's not value. It is value. And it says that in the legal frameworks as well. But people have kind of forgotten about that. Um, flexibility to incorporate local needs and markets. Um, so we're saying if you're going to innovate, use local people, use local investors, local crowdfunders, because that is a responsible thing to do. Don't go using companies more over the place. Scalability. One of this is one of the in, in, interesting things at the moment. So all of these ideas, like family businesses, the crowdsourcing, all these kind of things, people say, oh yeah, we can only give you a small company. Well, some big companies are starting to say, hmm, maybe we can scale this up. So again, we're trying to come up with business models that you can apply to any business. Okay, not just kind of small family-based businesses. Uh, uh, again, the area replicable across a range of business sectors, inclusive of all relevant stakeholders in the design of new business models. You cannot come up with a new business model unless you talk to the people involved in it. That's what we're saying. And it's got to be authorizational, authorizationable. So it's all very well come up with these nice academic stuff that we sometimes do. Here's a lovely model there. And then you go to business and they say, well, we can't do anything with it. It's not going to work. It looks pretty, but so it's got to actually work. And this was really the kind of first point in trying to come up with a, a new kind of research opportunity. So innovation produces opportunity. It must be responsible if it's going to work. Responsible innovation should, should begin at the level of the business model, and responsible innovation research should begin at the business model as well. So I was trying to tell all these academics to stop working out things like new products or plastics and have a look and say, well, should we actually be doing this in the first place, or should we be providing a different service, if you like? There's some more things for you to read because you love reading, don't you? Mm -hmm. Rob body doesn't give you enough. Okay, any questions? <laughs> cool. So, yeah, the other thing that Robert said to briefly touch on, because he's asked you to write a journal article, hasn't he? So you've all finished it now. Is it all handed in? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> yeah, the, uh, this was more as well uh, for me. Uh, a lot of you have probably uh, um, as well now the, uh, in the back of the mind still the dissertation. And I know uh, a lot of you have already engaged as well in the proposal writing, but still I, I thought it might be worthwhile to touch again on, on topics that may be interesting to the sustainability. Is, is that of interest? So, uh, um, where do you see the research going from here? Yeah, the research goes from here. So, the journal that you probably use in the most, or you read the most, is the International Journal of Project Management. It's the, probably the premier project management journal. And at the moment, um, they're having a kind of spate of special issues on sustainability. And it's driven by a few academics, myself included, and Michael Gilbert Silvius and Lon Schiffer, who are kind of thinkers in this area getting together and kind of saying, okay, so how can we kind of drive responsible, sustainable project management through the academic literature? Because there isn't much on it, okay? A lot of what's been written has been written by students. So as I said, my second highest cited paper was written by a student from here three, four years ago because no one was researching sustainable project management. He did his, he did his um, thesis on it and we, we, you know, we packaged it up and we, we published it. And so the International General Project Management has three calls out. It has one on sustainable project management. I mean, what is it? It's like, for God's sake, we've been doing this for like five years here. <laughs> and it's not even in the academic sphere yet. There's one out there which is looking at sustainability in mega projects. And that's always been of interest. We had a student do that a few years ago. What was his name? Javier was a Spanish guy. And so, sustainability in mega projects. He looked at the Olympics. So, every Olympics um, event so far has been not just because of the Olympics, they, they've always been given to a place where it needed regeneration. So in the UK, it was in the south end of well, London, where it was a pretty crap area. Um, in Brazil, the same thing. In Atlanta, it was a similar thing. The idea was that when the Olympics moved on, after that few weeks, there'd be this lovely legacy of beautiful places where people could play and live. And it hasn't happened anywhere apart from the London Olympics. Okay? And it's been, and it's been lots written about this over a few years. So you got look at the ones in Paris and all the rest of it. The housing that was built to house the Olymp Olympic athletes was supposed to become social housing for poor people. In most of the Olympics, it just hasn't happened. It's either been left in ruin or it's been bought up by investors and developers. And the reason being, we looked at this for this paper, was um, they weren't thinking about the legacy when they were doing the project management. They were just like, well, here's a project, we build it, we get the Olympics off, we finish. They weren't building in that kind of, what happens 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line? They did that on the Olympics in London for the first time ever. They, they worked backwards, they backcasted, they said, what do we want this to be in 30 years' time? How do we get there? This is what we need to do now before we start the project to get there. Usually in project management, you do it the other way around. Don't you? <coughs> you say, well, how do we get to the end of this? How do we deal with this service? And you forget about the rest. You do, yeah. Because it's been that can't express themselves in an academic way. It's disregarded. We do. A good example of that in the UK is is anyone here from Denmark or Sweden? <coughs> Yeah, lots of wind turbines. You know, you love your you, you love your wind up there, and the Danes and uh, uh, um, the Dutch as well. They love their wind turbines. Yeah, in the UK, we've been trying to get wind turbines off the ground, for one of a better word, for a long time. Okay, and we've got a, we've got a better wind resource than the Netherlands and Denmark, believe it or not. We are a much windier country, but we cannot build them in, in uh, on, on shore very easily. Okay, we want to build them offshore. It's much more expensive. The reason being is we have a very different model to the Danes and the Dutch. So in the UK, we have what we call a plan, build, and defend model, okay? Where we say, we're gonna put a wind turbine there, we'll go and we'll tell the community, tough shit, you're getting in there kind of thing. They kind of spend a lot of time kind of arguing about it, goes to all these inspectors, it takes a long time, government come in and say, no, we're gonna build it anyway, it gets built, protests all the time. It's a long time, it's very difficult, costs a lot of money. In Denmark and Netherlands, they do it very differently. They go into the community and say, can we build a wind turbine here? And they said, mm, I'm not so sure about that. I said, well, what we'll do is we'll give you some of the energy that comes out of it at a cheaper cost. Okay, maybe do you want to invest in it? We'll start with a little company. You can invest in it, and you'll get some money back out of the energy that we're selling. They have this much more participatory, community-focused way of doing things, and so they don't get all the problems with communities saying, we don't want it here, we don't like the look of that. It's not rocket science, is it? Isn't there a small island, I'm not sure it's dead where the residents have basically crowdfunded their own uh, wind turbines and thereby get a um, they get all their electricity for 
free up the dividend from the profits and selling. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we got some wind turbines. We got some community wind turbines in this country to do that. Yeah. It was very popular about six or seven years ago. Well, um, but yeah. then governments changed, and all the incentives went, and now it's not economic to do that anymore. Because um, there's one in Blythe. I used to have a friend working for a company that specialised just in going into communities, setting up those projects, helping them get ready, and then putting out, and then doing the next one. Because it was. Uh, Yes, one more, more. That's the one. It's yeah. the water too, I mean, definitely. Yeah. So the idea is, if you're as a project manager, if you get the people that you're working with on board, it makes your life a hell of a lot easier. Yeah. Again, it's not difficult. It's not rocket science to go out there and speak to the community, do your consultation before you start doing your project. But in the UK, we tend to develop the project, go in and just implement it, and then everyone around us is all our stakeholders are going, "Well, hang on, we're not doing like that." And again, just talking to them and telling them what you're doing, it's that simple. Transparency. Transparency, absolutely. Listening, do you know what I mean? Um, when I was working in the local government, we were building all these houses, we were building a thousand homes for elderly people. We spent so much time just going into these nursing homes and talking to the residents, going on to all the people next door. Every time someone had an issue, what about this? We would listen to it, we'd come up with a solution, we'd usually head it off. Whereas that had not been done in the past. In the past, they'd just gone, there'd be these big arguments, the planners would reject it, and then you'd have all this cost and everything. Just talk to your stakeholders. You can't you kind of sort out every problem, but some people just want to be listened to. Simple as that. You'd have people like coming and complaining about this and that and that, really ranting at you. And then at the end of it, they go, oh, thanks for listening. I'm happy about it. They just want to get off their chests. So yeah, sustainability so mega projects. And what's the other one? So, yeah, another one out for sustainability and disaster management projects as well. So disaster management projects. So for, for instance, famine relief or building shelters in Haiti following an earthquake or Pakistan things like that because that's something that the development community has been doing very well for a long time. I used to teach in the masters, we had a masters in disaster management and sustainable development here as well and that's what they teach. So how do you go in as an NGO into Pakistan following the earthquake for instance and put together a project to rebuild the housing, to save the people there, to, do you know I mean, to re re reproduce the water and everything. How do you do that sustainably? Because it used to be the case is we fly people in, they go out and they fix the problem, they fly out again but then the local the local community aren't that went off because the houses are all falling apart, they don't know how to maintain them. They you know put a nice water well in Malawi or somewhere, but they don't know how to maintain it or fix it. So we've learned a lot from that and now we go out and we use the local people, skill them up, teach them how to repair these things, teach them how to build a building, teach them how to run the projects. So when you move out, they can run it themselves. And we're trying to bring that across into general project management. Okay, so project management for engineering and all the rest of it, you can take the same approach build capacity within the people you're working with. Um, so if, again, if you're building a house, for instance, or a housing development, working with the people who are going to be living in that community so that they can work out how to use their systems. One of the, I used to work again in um, things like building sustainable buildings, co-sustainable homes. So building, in the UK, you've probably seen, we have like strapped buildings with single glazing. Um, you never get that in Denmark, would you? Well, not many places. Um, a Sweden, places like that, because if it's cold, it's cold. So we used to do a lot of work with people on that, and we put all these new clever fancy systems into people's houses to save energy. Could they use it? No. We go, here's your new house, thank you very much. How do I turn this under floor heating on? I've never seen that in the UK before. Okay, you know, what do I do with this triple glazed window? How do I use it? How do I open it? What's the best strategy for allowing warmth and heat out? We don't do that, so again, working with people is a way of dealing with that problem. So there's a lot of interest in sustainable project management. If you do what I said and type sustainable project management to Google, We'll see lots of jobs asking for sustainable project answers. Seems to be a thing at the moment. Yeah, I think that this is why an interesting book we have uh, uh, repeatedly had the problem in the UK that uh, um, the initial criteria that we set up for sustainability have actually changed over time. So we haven't really, uh, what we had this for last week, really evaluated any of our. Uh, um, so-called incentives that we had. And I think that, that is as well a, a fascinating area that has become very popular scene at the moment. And that is where well at control and uh, um, really steering as well for sustainability. And that looks then as well at uh, smart mechanisms to have the right people actually maybe be even guardians on your project. And so uh, there is this argument that maybe in the future uh, so the community to be accountable for this is actually a very weak approach because you have many opinions and to, to really have that a vocal point that can kind of press as well maybe the, uh, companies that they are externally or, or sit maybe on boards 
the internal, uh, it's very, very difficult. So the argument was really to have maybe uh, rules of external uh, guardianship of sustainability and maybe even like have reduction aims. And the reduction aims are still very global. This is where what we have with the global issue is. When you look at how it impacts on the project, often the assessment is not completely correct. That, that is a very, uh, um, I uh, think, hot topic as well. How do you do the translation from these strategic <coughs> goals to the implementation? And what, what are the uh, subsequent roles on it? But uh, again, so the, there's an element of governance as well. That quite governance is a really interesting theme. It's the same in organizations. If you go, if you look at organizations, a lot of their top reports and everything are sort of fantastic, all the things that they do, their CSR strategies, their environment strategies. But then you look at what they're actually doing on the ground, and a lot of times it's not implemented. And most businesses have a problem with this middle management. And it's the same with project management. You could be the project manager and set up the best project ever, and yet it doesn't get implemented on the ground because you haven't put in to, you know, the governance running through it to do that. The thing that I've observed is the, the every actor has a reaction. The people on the very bottom, it's all right talking about this and the global, but then the mindset, we're all included in that, is there are means of when they actually see the impact of just throwing that plastic bottle down, and then it's gathered up at the end of the week and said, well, here's what happened. Then it hits home. So now, if that is done on that small scale there, there's millions upon millions of small scales. We yeah. the balance out there, we can take it back. Well, one of the things that they did on the London Olympics, which is useful, there's a great video of it. Um, so anyone who works in construction, are you all engineers? You're not all of you, are you? If you work in something like construction, for instance, you, you, before you can go onto a site and work and start building something, you will have you know, an induction into health and safety, which will say, okay, before you come on this site, this is how you get, don't get yourself killed, frankly, and you know, all the rest of it. Well, what they have on the, on the London Olympics, what they have on some projects is they have an induction into sustainability as well. So basically, they all sat down, watched a video, had a talk about, this is why we are doing these things. This is why this is slightly different. This is the effect that it's having. And the research that came out of that was people's mindsets were changing. and they were like, oh yeah, okay. And so we've implemented that here now as well. So when we have new staff coming into this university, any organization you go to, you will have a, a induction. You know, they'll walk you around the building, this is the fire exit, this is this. We also have a sustainability induction here now. These are what the bins are for, this is how you use recycling, this is what we do here, these are our, this is how you work our systems. And the idea is, if you don't educate people in that way, it's pointless. We put these little switches everywhere that say, turn off the lights. I mean, they're no good unless you actually educate people as to why that's happening, build it into their day, build it into their targets, and it's not a big thing to do. So one of the things you have in project management is you have your project charter, usually at the start. You can build that into your project charter. Every person that works on this project must exhibit this, 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 and this. And then they feel part of the Yeah, they're part of the decision. And the real good thing is to target them on it as well. We covered that as well in project governance, where we looked at different ways of uh, kind of implementing this. So, um, if you remember the maturity model that Nina suggested, kind of started at the first level that you have a training, you have to just kind of cover the basics, make sure that people have a um, basic understanding how to use it. And then the, the most mature level was really where people understand the principles and have bought in and embrace it as values where you kind of have a culture where they naturally understand what it's about that they're trying to do and uh, build this into their work practice. But that, that is very hard to arrive at, uh, if not even often impossible, depending on your outcome and your size. But uh, that, that is certainly uh, one way of implementing it. Yes. Uh, other questions, maybe? Observations? They don't. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> they have two more hours with me. So <laughs> with you, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to go and teach business ethics. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Business ethics for students. Brilliant. Uh, oh, yes.